Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Brigitta Varadinek. I'm working in the law firm Linden Partners. This is my colleague Elisabeth Kremer, also from Linden Partners. Um, for us, it's the first time that we speak about legal problems on a party. So I um, hope we will have fun, although legal uh, subjects in general are a bit difficult, in particular, uh, in particular if um, we, ha we only deal about German law, which is uh, sometimes uh, especially hard to understand from people coming from other countries. So we try to keep it simple, although it's not always as simple. Um, let me first say some words about Linden Partners. We founded the firm six years ago. We, the founders, um, we worked in uh, big international law firms uh, before, and uh, yeah, then we wanted to do something on our own. Uh, so we are a sort of startup as well, and uh, so we know all the problems which may arise when founding a new firm and so on. And I can tell you, legal problems and also tax problems uh, are matters you have to deal with. Um, so my subject today is hiring developers, um, keeping the code in the company. Um, I would like, um, first of all, just for introduction, uh, give some explanation about how I can protect an idea. Um, we, ha we know, and this is, I think, common in uh, most, of the, um, most of the countries, in most of the legal systems, we have different um, IP rights. Um, for example, works of art, music, architecture, this all you know, we c is protected by copyright law. Technical inventions may be protected by a patent. A patent is a registers, registered um, right, so you have to go to the patent office and ask for a patent. Uh, in Germany and some other European countries, we also have um, the utility patent. This is a sort of small brother of the patent. Um, this is also a registered, uh, registered um, uh, right, but it is not verified uh, by the office. So you only go to the office, you say you want to have this right, and you will get it. And it's only afterwards, for example, if someone contests this right, then a court will decide if it is valid or not. So it's, it's a bit less valid than, for example, a patent uh, where you have a long procedure before it is granted and it is really examined if it's new, if there are other rights uh, going uh, against it. Then we have patterns and models protected by a design. We have all the sort of trademarks. Um, there we know the registered trademarks. You go to the patent and trademark office, you get, um, uh, you get the mark registered. But also if you only, um, if you use um, a trademark only in, in commerce, then you can have a, a trademark right you, which um, is valid against um, third parties. Um, but for this end you have to use the trademark for quite a while and it has to be known in commerce. But this might be important, for example, if you want to, for your company, you want to use um, a sign as a trademark and you go to the patent office, trademark office, and you see um, which trademarks are registered, and you, f you, you don't find uh, a similar mark, then someone can say, yeah, but we used it already since 10 years without having a registered mark. So always keep in mind, also when you just use the trademark, this may be a, a valid uh, right. Then um, also secret uh, knowledge might be protected, um, but only as long as it is really secret. Uh, as soon as it is um, known in the public, and public might be the friend from, uh, from school who you tell about an idea, 
then it's not longer secret and it's not longer protected. So in, in principle, if something is not protected by one of these IP rights, everybody can use it. This is especially you for business ideas. For example, in the US, business ideas may be protected by a patent. This is not possible in Europe. So your business idea is not protected by an IP right. And if you, uh, you, you disclose it to the public, everybody can imitate it. The, s the same is true, for example, for an invention. An invention has to be applied for, uh, for a patent. Otherwise, if, if it is known by somebody, everybody can use it. Or even for copyrights, it is true. As long as the work, as um, the idea is not incorporated in a work, uh, everybody is free to use the idea if you tell about it. So there's one exception. If really things go really wrong, we have um, the German fair trade law. This is always if something, things went really wrong and you talked about an idea to somebody else and he just stole your idea or something like this, this might help in some cases. But it's much more important to know how to protect your idea, your invention, your trademark. And if you can't protect it, don't talk about it. Um, if you talk about it to investors or to third parties to get an idea how it is, for example, accepted by the public, then um, it is uh, recommended to sign a non-disclosure uh, agreement before. So, what is about software? Software is protected by copyright law. So, a copyright in Germany, you don't have to register. As soon as you uh, write a program, it is protected by the German copyright. Um, this is true for the source code. Also, if these are all only minor programs, they are protected by copyright. You haven't to do anything else than to program it. If it is an important software where something really new is, um, is realized, you al always have to keep in mind that a patent um, may be possible. Uh, this is something quite new in Europe. Uh, I know in the US, um, software uh, patents, they existed uh, since quite a long time. In Europe, it is quite new. Well, it's a, it's, it's a recent development. But, um, so I'm not a patent attorney, so I highly recommend if you think that your software might be really incorporate a new idea, ask a patent attorney who is specialized in it if a patent protection is possible because then you have a wide, larger protection than with copyright. So, I will come now to the question, who owns the code? Um, in principle, in Germany, and I think in most of the European countries, um, it is the creator who owns the code. Um, so it's a bit a different conception to what we know from the US, where um, you, can, you have this principle of um, work might for hire, where um, the, an employed um, programmer has no rights in the software, the, all the copyrights are with the company. This is not true for Germany. Um, the creator owns the copyrights, and a copyright can't be transferred. You only can give license in this copyright. This is very important. It's a completely different conception from, for example, the American conception. 
So this is why um, when you found a company, for example, on the basis of an important software, always keep in mind who owns the copyright and are all the rights you need to make your business are really granted in form of a license to the company. So, in a normal license agreement, you can then, for example, define if the rights are um, granted exclusively or non-exclusively, worldwide or regionally, temporarily or, or unlimited in time, if uh, the, the, the way of using the software uh, should be limited or if it's um, open for every kind of use and so on. This you should um, you should regulate in the um, in the license agreement. And uh, in Ger in uh, German law, we have a special uh, regulation which is very creator friendly. That says if you don't have a special um, rule in the contract, the rights will stay with the creator. So if you don't have a contract at all, the, the uh, licensee will have only the rights which are necessary to fulfill the contract, but nothing more. So when you, when you see it from the company side, the best is to have a written contract where all the kind of uh, using the software and so on are really in the contract. So, how do you get the code into the company? As we know now, the, the copyrights are always with the creator. So, in principle, the, uh, the employee is obliged to, um, to give a license to his employer. This is a kind of uh, it's 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 from the if you have an employment agreement and you are uh, you you are a photograph and you shall take photos for the newspaper. Uh, of course, the newspaper must have the rights to use the photos. Um, but in principle, you always need a special contract. This is a bit different for software. There. Um, the German law, and I think it's um, it's based on a community regulation, so it must be the same in uh, in all the European countries. Um, there's a special rule for uh, software made by employees. There, all the um, all the rights, all the economic rights, are with the company. So this is a big exception from the normal transfer of copyrights. Here we have a sort of legal license in favor of the, um, of the uh, employer. Um, condition is that the software was developed um, in, in fulfillment of the employment contract. So, um, Taking the example of an accountant, um, so he is employed to doing these uh, accountant things, and uh, then he says, oh, it's so difficult with all these um, numbers to give it into the computer by hand. I will, um, I will write a small program helping with my accountants. So then this software program um, will be regarded as part of his uh, work he's obliged to do. So all the rights, the economic rights, will be with the employer. But um, if this accountant, for example, sees that his colleagues from the marketing section, they have huge problems in organizing these marketing events, and he says, oh, I have a good idea, and he writes a small program to help this marketing uh, people, then the rights will be with him. It's not part of his um, uh, obligation uh, within his uh, contractual ob obligations as employee. So that if the uh, company wants to use this software program, he needs a license from uh, his uh, accountant.
So what is about freelancer? Uh, there the situation is different. Um, for freelancers, we don't have this uh, legal license. So if you, as company, uh, engage um, a, a freelancer, uh, it is important to have a contract with him where um, he's obliged to give all the economic rights in the software program to the employer. Otherwise, you might have problems afterwards. Um, yeah, one thing, um, perhaps it's, and it, as I said before, if you don't um, have a specific contract, you just, you know, oh, it's a friend and he comes and helps you and so on, of course, some of the rights um, to use the software will be with the company even without um, written contract. But as we have this principle that if nothing is um, ruled, most of the rights will stay with the author, um, I really highly recommend not only to say, yeah, he grants a license in the rights in the software, but to name them. We had a lot of problems, for example, with, um, with license, where um, the, u the, the right to use um, it, for example, in the internet was not especially written in the contract. And afterwards, there were a lot of courts um, uh, saying that these rights uh, stayed with the author and not with the company. The same is true if you buy, for example, software from a, a, a software house or from, from a, one of the big um, software companies. Um, it is always important to know exactly which kind of rights uh, you get when you buy this uh, software, especially if afterwards you modify it or if you, um, you have a contract with the subcontractor um, based on standard software and so on. It's always important to be sure that you have all the rights you need for your special business model. Um, so. Uh, in particular, if you, for example, have a contract with uh, one of the big uh, software companies, you're not allowed to modify the software, you're not allowed to sub-license, you're not allowed to transfer the rights, and so on. Um, it's, in particular, important to, um, to have this um, chain of rights closed because if if you are a new founded company and an investor comes in he will do a due diligence and then it's very important that if your um, business model is based on software that you can prove that you have all the rights to completely use this software that there are no rights of uh, other of third parties in this software so as we as we saw it before for example with the employees it's quite easy you just sh uh, show him the employment contract so he knows everything which was programmed by um, the employee all the rights will be with the company it starts to get more complicated for example if it is the founder often it is the founder who first uh, programs the company, then he will be uh, CEO for some years and after, afterwards he leaves the company. So if you have never made a written agreement, he's not an employee, so it is not sure that the rights are with the company. So when an investor comes in and he, uh, he controls if the rights are in the company, he will ask you to get a license agreement uh, with the, um, with the uh, original founder. And then you can try to find him to sign a license agreement. We often had this in practice that it's quite difficult afterwards to get all these um, license chain realized. Um, yeah. Same is uh, true for freelancers and subcontractors. So, um, I mean, it's true for all these legal uh, stuff. It's very important to, uh, to be really very um, diligent from the beginning on, because once uh, things are not uh, really done, uh, it, 
it may it will cause problems um, yeah normally uh, when the first investor comes in and really makes a due diligence of the company he will see where all the problems in the company are and then uh, you will have these problems so this was the first part um, I think we make a short gap for questions and then my colleague uh, Elizabeth will continue So I see you. Uh, yeah. Then um, the rights are with the, uh, the the economic rights. Are not there. We we have a distinction between moral rights and economic rights. But what is important is are the economic rights. Even if he leaves, they are when an employee um, makes a pro program during his working time then all the rights are with the company. So even if afterwards he leaves, no problem. Now, if you have an employment contract, it's, in, it's the most uh, easy way to get it into the, to get the uh, rights in the company. I, I don't want to say that it, it's more difficult with a freelancer, but you have to know that it's a problem and that you have to have a contract uh, dealing these uh, things. Hello? Okay. I have another question. Uh, you mentioned uh, if an employee developed a small program for the business, business department, for example, mm -hmm. which is not part of his contract, that uh, he has the rights for this program. But uh, if it's in the work time, I pay as a, a founder. In, mm -hmm. What's the situation? I pay him for uh, doing his work, but he doesn't do his work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, it's a contravention to his working contract, but it doesn't change uh, the answer uh, with respect to the rights in the software. Okay. I mean, it's the same when he's painting uh, uh, something or write, um, writing a book within his working time. He's not allowed to do it, uh, but uh, you, are not the, you have not the rights in this book he's writing during his working time. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. If you have an idea, um, but you're not a developer, you team up with the developer, you have the idea for the software, the developer creates the software, the one who has the idea has nothing because the code is written by the developer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. this, is, this might be a difference, for example, to a patent. Because uh, with a patent, it's not the... The, the programming as such which is protected but it's really the idea this is why for example if I'm not a programmer so I, I just say as, as I imagine it is if two programmers at the same time program the same computer program they have both copyrights and the same program this is not possible with a patent because in a patent it's the idea which is protected so it's, um, it's something different from this concrete work, you know. And copyright always protects a concrete work, but not the idea. Uh, hello. I'm wondering, can one write a contract in such a way as to confer the company all rights to everything that a person does in his working time as well as the free time do, uh, during the employment time? Uh, for example, such, just such thing like first, uh, first rights. I have to show the company what I've done, uh, if I've done it in the working time or not. Um. Yes, uh, I think this is possible. I think there might be some limits when it is. Was heißt denn sittenwidrig? Against moral standards. Against moral standards. <laughs> In German, it is called sittenwidrig. So there are always uh, limits where you can't, you know, um, you can't. Uh, uh, treat your employ employee like a slave, you know. So there are some limits what is not allowed. But otherwise, of course, if you, for example, I mean, uh, I think 
often in 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 programming it's uh, it's i mean what i said what is uh, true for employment contracts it is not um, the program must not, must not only be written during his working time, but the um, rights are with the employer also when he programs it um, in accordance with uh, the um, which with the uh, with according to facts given by the employer. You know, if if he says um, please. Um, um, make this uh, computer program and he does it at, uh, in his home office, it makes no difference. Hmm? Uh, so we're doing uh, web development and uh, there's different people that are writing a code. And what happens with the final product if there is five coders? Who owes what and how to protect it? So if, uh, if there are several uh, developers, which is uh, common, um, then they are co-authors. They own the copyright altogether. So if... So if you you mean if um, if one um, has a minor part in the in the whole work, uh, yeah, then he's uh, he has minor part in the copyright. In the whole, in the whole, mm. it, because normally you can't really uh, separate it. Huh? It's if you can separate then if you um, if you can separate the work, then um, you have two different copyrights. But if it's one work, then you own it together. This is something which is very important also for, um, for inventions, for patents, because there it is the same. And sometimes it's very difficult to say who really has the idea. We often have, you know, um, uh, people sitting in the evening in the bar drinking some beers and you know all the you, you know the situation you're sitting there and you develop ideas and one word gives the others and at the end you have a, a super idea but you can't tell who really had this idea so uh, then you have to say okay it was the idea of uh, all the three even if the real idea was only Okay, then um, Elisabeth will continue. Okay, uh, now we're coming to part two of our presentation. Um, my topic is data protection laws and web 2.0, social media marketing, and how to avoid unwelcome surprises. Personal data is the currency of the web 2.0. <clears throat> Facebook and its stock market launch have proven this quite plainly. Social media services have become a treasure trove for the advertisement industry. As Europeans place high, high value on privacy, the issue of data protection in the web has become increasingly relevant in the past few years. The speed at which new technologies are launched, for example, the Facebook like button 
or Google's analytics service is a challenge for safeguarding data privacy. USA and Europe have a different approach to data protection. Whereas in Europe, the collection and processing of data is principally, principally requires an approval that's called the opt-in version. In the US, everything's possible until the right holder objects, the so-called opt-out version. As most established social networks are based in the US, this raises the question of which data protection laws apply in the Web 2.0, leading to the topic of my presentation. I will, first, I will talk about the applicability and the requirements of German data privacy laws. The second, in the second part of the presentation, I will depict the pitfalls for data privacy within social media marketing on the basis of three problem areas. And finally, I will talk about the consequences for violating data privacy laws. According to the territorial principle, German data privacy laws are applicable in international social media services. That is because the laws do not refer to the place of the server, but the place where the data collection and processing takes place. There's an exception if, um, if uh, there's a U e EU office. Um, for example, with Facebook, they have an office in Ireland, but still German data protection laws are applicable because that office in Ireland is a mere complaints office, but not a headquarter where the processing and the collection of the data takes place. The rel relevant legislation in Germany can be found in the German Teleservice Act and the Federal Data Protection Act. Regarding the collection of personal data, the relevant definitions for companies are on the one hand the controller, that shall mean any person or body which collects, processes or uses personal data on his, her or its own behalf or which commissions others to do the same. This, re this is connected to the company and the object is personal data, which shall mean any information concerning the personal or material circumstances of an identified or identifiable natural person. The IP address is a special case. The German data protection authorities consider this as a personal data because there is an indirect identifiability to the holder of the IP address, which makes IP addresses um, a personal data. So if you have personal data, the collection, the storage, the processing, the distribution and the use underlies certain requirements under German legislation. Generally, this is prohibited unless there is a legal permission or an explicit consent of the right holder, for example, by a checkbox. There's the obligation to, of the controller to inform the right holder, so transparency has to be established regarding the collection of which data, to which extent, and for which purpose. The cancellation policy demands the deletability of the data at any time, According to the earmarking category, um, which is a principle of dedicated use, the collected data cannot be utilized for other purposes than the ones consented to. That is, the data, for example, the data collected for an online competition cannot be used later for advertisements. According to the principle of data avoidance, the collection of data cannot be done on stock, so you can't just collect data and see later what you want to do with it. And the principle of data economy means that you shouldn't collect data unnecessarily. For example, you shouldn't collect uh, the birth date for 
um, a competition where you don't need the birth date. And finally, there's the duty to delete the data after the appropriate use. So the question is, do I or my company need a data privacy statement? The answer is yes. If you have an independent online presence, for example, a blog platform, or if you have if you collect data within a platform for your own reasons, for example, because you offer a contest on the Facebook platform or you offer apps on another one's platform. The designing of a legal data privacy statement is determined in the German Teleservice Act in section 13. According to that um, norm, you have to inform on the type, the scope, the purpose, of the data collection to the right holder and you have to clearly indicate on your um, online presence um, a notice regarding data privacy policy with a link on the home page and that content cannot be more than two clicks away for the user to reach. This brings me to the second part of the presentation, the pitfalls regarding social media marketing. I will outline three problem areas. The first is user tracking by means of cookies. The second pitfall will be Google Analytics. And the third part is social plugins based on the example of the like button. The user tracking by means of cookies is um, collection of user behavior and online interactions for the purpose of commercial and market analysis. What happens is that cookies track, of, track the user behavior concerning where he came from, where he goes to, and for, long, for how long he stays on a homepage, which links he clicks, etc. Most of you might know how cookies work, but uh, to visualize this, I want to show the next slide. So when a browser demands um, a data file in terms of when you open um, a new website, the server sends an answer on which a cookie is attached. The cookie data is deposited on the browser. And upon a subsequent request, the browser sends back the received cookies. And in that the user profile is tracked. Regarding the user tracking, the principle is that there's a necessity of approval of the person affected when you use non-pseudonymized data, for example, regarding the IP address, when you, when you track a complete IP address that is not cut short. If there is a pseudonymous profile, for example, a shortcutted IP address, um, the, there is a, the enabling provision in the Teleservice Act, um, which has three conditions. First of all, you're not allowed to merge the user profile with fur further data of that person. The user has to be notified regarding the right of the objection, and the user, there, there cannot be an objection of the user. So if the user opted out, you can no longer track that profile. The Düsseldorfer Kreis, which is a working party of Germany's federal states data protection commissioners, has put up guidelines uh, regarding the legal, legal, legality of uh, this tracking. So first of all, the right holder has to consent to the tracking of the personal data. Otherwise, the IP address, for example, the IP address has to be cut short. Second, the right holder has to be given the right of objection, whether he um, consents to the collection or the tracking or not. Third, there's the prohibition of merging the tracking data 
with other data of that person. And fourth, the information, the, the user has to be informed on the collection of the data and has to know his user's right within the data privacy policy. So for this reason, um, the policy has to be, as I put it before, on a two clicks away, the user has to be able to read this data privacy policy. This brings me to the second pitfall, Google Analytics. Most of you uh, might have companies who use Google Analytics, but for those who have not been in touch with it, it's a free analysis and tracking service um, where, which can be installed um, by embedding cones on a website um, and which, which does user tracking too. According to the Düsseldorfer Kreis, this working group which I've introduced, um, the use of Google Analytics used to be illegal, but they put up guidelines which have to be conformed with in order to um, legally comply with the German data protection laws. So first of all, the IP address has to be anonymized. This means that before the IP address is sent to the service in the US, the IP address has to be cut short because once the IP address has reached the Google service in the US, there's no anonymization anymore. So the, the company using Google Analytics has to ensure that this cutting short of the IP address happens before it reaches Google Analytics. The visitor of the website has to be informed about using Google Analytics. The company has to put up a cancellation policy and the right of objection so that in case the company uses Google Analytics, the, the user can object to it. And there's again the, pro the prohibition of using, of merging data which is important with Google because Google has um, various data such as Google Plus, Google Mail, and um, especially with Google, there's, there's the pro prohibition to merge data, for example, from Google Mail with data from Google Analytics. And finally, the company who use, which uses Google Analytics has to seal an agreement with Google a so-called order data processing that's um, that is that regulation is based on section 11 of the federal data protection act and the model contract for for uh, this agreement can be found on the homepage that i listed below Coming to the third pitfall, user analysis by social plugins, depicted by the example of the like button. Plugins um, on a page of companies are used an, as an analysis tool, in this case for Facebook. If a company installs the Facebook plugin on its website, Facebook collects data when this web page is visited. The collection includes the information concerning the time, um, the URL of the user, the browser, and the IP, IP address, and other information too. The plug-in, especially the like button, is especially problematic regarding the data privacy because um, Facebook autonomously collects the user data without informing the user. The collection of the user data is independent of a Facebook account or a Facebook login. So even those of us who might be just a few, but even those who don't have a Facebook account um, and are not logged in into Facebook will be tracked by this uh, analysis of Facebook or th their data will be collected. And the user does, does not have any opportunity to opt out of this collection of data. And even though Facebook controls this process, so they control what data they collect, the companies who have put up a plug-in 
on their website are responsible for the data collection um, according to the Düsseldorfer Kreis. So the, the German um, data protection authorities have decided that companies who have a plugin are responsible for what kind of data is collected by Facebook. In order to minimize the risks for the companies who have a plugin, um, the risks of violating data privacy laws, there has been the proposal of the so-called two-click solution, which means that before the data collection of um, Facebook starts, the user has, is informed about this process and has the right to decide upon the activation of the plugin. So this could be um, this could be put into practice by um, a, a window that opens when he when a user tries to log into a website. A window opens saying this website uses plugins. Facebook is collecting data. Do you wish to activate this plugin? And then the the user can decide whether he wants to do so or not. The problem with this information is, is that the companies cannot inform about the extent and the purpose of the data collection because they don't know what Facebook is doing with the data and how many data they are collecting. And Facebook has not put out uh, the information on which data they collect and what they do with it. So the German data privacy laws um, cannot be conformed with because the information is uh, unknown. But the best you can do is, on the one hand, to do this um, two-click solution, and on the other hand, um, there should be a data privacy policy um, with, with which incorporates the following um, um, messages to the user. So you don't have to read it all, but just to point out what is important is it should be highlighted that the website uses the plugin. It should be highlighted that the browser establishes a direct connection to Facebook servers, even though one is not logged in into Facebook or even though one doesn't even have an account of Facebook. And um, so that the user who activates the, the plugin knows what he's doing. This is the final part of the presentation, the consequences of violating data privacy laws. On the one hand, there can be a pen penalty charge for up to 50,000 euro, according to the German Teleservice Act. But to, to um, make this appear less dangerous, the uh, German data authorities gener generally offer a right um, to comment on the violation, so they won't just simply um, have a penalty charge in their mailbox, but first of all, the authorities will come up to the companies and um, give the companies the, uh, the chance to say something about it and the chance to amend their violation. So if something's wrong, usually the company gets the right to um, make it legally correct. Um, then there's the question of whether written warnings by um, opponents are um, a danger. At the moment the prevailing opinion is that the violation of data protection laws is no violation of competition laws according to the German fair trade law because um, the German fair trade law requires a norm that is to regulate the market behavior and uh, the data protection laws are generally no laws that are to regulate the market behavior. So at the moment the pre prevailing opinion is that there is no, um, no competition law violated. Except when there is a purposeful, purposeful systematic violation um, for the purpose of realizing profits. For example, if data um, that have been collected uh, by a company are sold to another company, then there is a purposeful um, violation of the um, data protection. But thirdly, um, uh, um, an important part is the image damage that should not be estimated, especially um, 
if employees that might be unhappy with the company um, that report to German authorities about um, the violation of data protection laws, which does happen, and that's usually the biggest source for the authorities of knowledge where, which companies violate against data protection. So um, <coughs> this, this image damage, um, once it has reached the consumers, is, a, is an important part because users who, are, who do not trust the company anymore will log out and not use that platform anymore. Which brings me to my final recommendations. So, <clears throat> especially due to this image damage, you should ensure a full re realization of data protection requirements, which means especially to establish transparency for the users regarding the collection and the processing of personal data and the data protection policy. The companies who collect data should acquire full approval of the consumers and not do everything in the black box. So have a checkbox in the beginning and inform the user of what is happening to his data. Thirdly, refrain from merging personal data with pseudonymous data. And finally, when using plugins on your homepage, have the two-click solution and have an information on the data privacy policy about this um, use of the plugin. So if you have further questions, feel free now. My question is, are there any carve-outs for a site that's in beta, or do they need to be prepared to have this regime set up on, on the first day? Uh, what, what do you mean? Like, uh, I didn't understand the question fully, sorry. So, is it, so there's uh, no exemption for an emerging company, for example. Oh, okay. Well. Um, the exception is that the authorities have to know about you. And I think with an emerging company, that won't be the first address where they knock. So the thing is, um, do it as fast as possible, but I don't think the first day is, um, is going to be the date. And especially, as I told you, usually the authorities give you the chance to comment on your violation and to adapt to it. And um, if, if they haven't heard about you and if there's no employees running to authorities, there's not such a big danger. I think the, the, the problem is more a practical one. If you start a new company and you start collecting data and then uh, you get a um, huge company like Facebook and you don't know where these data came from and who uh, gave um, his uh, placid to use these um, data for what, you have real mess and you will never get out of it. So then you can, you have to delete all these data and start from, from the beginning because you are not allowed to use these data when you can't say uh, where you got them from if you have the consent of the, of, the, uh, of the users and so on. So our recommendation is really to try to do things right from the beginning on because if you have the consent of, of the users and you only use the data for which you have the consent, then you are on the, on the good side and you really can use the data. And I mean, data are really valid, so it's, um, it's important to have them and to work with them. And uh, so it's, it's much better to really do things right from the beginning on, get the consent from the, from the users where it is necessary, because they will give it. I mean, if they know where you use the data is for, they will give their consent because they want to use your website and then you are free to use these data. Yeah, and as I said, te technically it's quite simple because if you have this, um, if you have a slide and the user can click on it, most users will click on it quite fastly. So it's, it's just the question of putting up the, um, a slide with a click option. 
other questions? Yeah. Um, in the beginning, there was the applicability of uh, data protection laws on uh, websites which are not hosted in Germany. Um, when I have a website hosted in Spain, for example, um, I always thought that um, pages which are directed at German users must apply the data protection laws in Germany. For, for, for example, if I have a German translation or if I uh, use uh, German uh, payment methods. Mm, okay, so it's not so much where the home where this the home page, but the place where the data collection takes place and where the data is processed. So, if there's a server in Germany, no matter where the home page is, um, or no matter where you see the home page, but if the processing of the data takes place in Germany, then German data protection laws apply. Um, this, is, this is true for data protection, as Elisabeth said. What you mean is, in general, if ger when German law applies to um, to international websites and there you are right if a website offers or has offers um, directed to German consumers um, you have to respect German uh, consumer right so this is uh, for the general law for example for uh, competition law for all the co consumer protection law in general so if for example always you have when you have a website in German when you um, when you accept um, uh, to send, for example, your products to Germany, then you have to um, to comply with German consumer law. Okay. Thank you very much.